Welcome to Wealthy Living Conversations. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It's here that I connect with a variety of wonderful people to have inspiring and insightful conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. So the terms future of work, modern leadership, gender equality, inclusion, humanizing workplaces and employee well-being are all commonplace at the moment. So today I want to dive into a somewhat taboo subject that often gets ignored as part of these topical conversations, yet it directly affects the well-being of a large percentage of women in the workplace and has an impact on all staff and the business. And that topic is menopause or perimenopause. So to dive into this topic and gain a greater understanding of what women experience during this stage of life and what they need so that they can thrive at work, I'd like to welcome my guest today, Melissa McGowan. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, Lisa. Uh, great to be here. And as you say, they're, they're, those terms are all commonplace at the moment, but I love that you've been on this path for some time because, as we know, a lot of this stuff is not just new, is it? No, absolutely not. But um, it's it's great that there is an opening and an opportunity to now be a little bit more heard when it comes to maybe um, this this conversation. So it's really exciting, and I'm so happy to have you um, with me today to sort of explore this topic a bit further. So before we get into it, I just want to introduce you properly. So Melissa is a mum of four. She's a veteran C-suite executive. She's a leadership coach, menopause educator and advocate. She's held numerous human resource leadership roles around the globe, coaching thousands of people to perform at peak minus burnout. She founded Meno Collective after she quit her corporate career to improve her health after struggling with burnout and the early onset of menopause at just 44. Melissa realized that there was a lack of awareness on many impacts of menopause at work and decided to do something to change that. She's passionate about educating and empowering women and workplaces. She challenges the wider world to view menopause as a well-being, commercial and cultural workplace opportunity. So amazing. And it's, you know, good on you, Melissa, for really entering this space, which has maybe a little bit of controversy or not even not controversy, but is uncomfortable for many people to talk about because it still has a little bit of a stigma or shame around it when you and I both know that it really shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, it's so true. And I think conversations like this, you know, immediately start reducing stigma, like just opening the dialogue. So thanks for thanks for being here to do that. But you, you mentioned the word shame and, you know, it's a heavy word, um, you know, despite how much we listen to Brene Brown, shame is still a very heavy topic. And yet when I was faced with this very binary choice of quit my corporate job at the peak of my career as the breadwinner in our family because my health was struggling so much and I'd bounced around you know eight doctors and trying to figure out what was going on it was like I was just so done and I broke down to my husband one day and said you know I feel like there's only two options I can quit my job with no real backup plan to be honest or I can push on and keep going and further risk you know my health which was already impacting you know me my family and my work and so this is an uncomfortable conversation and I like a lot of things you know personal pain turned into into passion but that binary choice that I had and I, ch I chose to quit my job you know neither were a great option it wasn't a good option for me wasn't a great option for my workplace and so part of I think what we're trying to do here and just open this kind of dialogue around women's health and perimenopause and leadership and workplace is so that there's more options. There's more options for women and there's more options for workplaces right at the time where, you know, we need our women to be in decision-making roles and stepping into leadership if that's there for them because it really does um, come down to 
in my view, a quality and economy. And I think it's a big opportunity, like you said in your intro. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into more of the way that menopause um, or perimenopause can impact women in the workplace or impact women just anyway in general, how yeah. do you define for the listeners, like what's the difference between menopause and perimenopause? And can you clarify like how long the symptoms generally last yes. for and what the common age group is? Yeah, and I think it's so important to to keep grounding ourselves in these um, basics. And I know perhaps many of your listeners might listeners might have attended uh, Mia Friedman's uh, very Perry Summit recently, which when I caught up with the uh, menopause doctor that I have on my team, we we said you know already she's saying that's raising awareness, right? So this is a relatively new term, perimenopause. So let me just kind of break this down a little bit. Um, as we probably know, you know, all women experience a menopause transition, um, as do, you know, some trans women and um, non-binary people. Around 80% of women going through menopause will be affected by the symptoms of menopause. About 25% of women will experience more debilitating symptoms. Right? So when we're talking about menopause, we're really talking about a transition and, and life stage from a woman's reproductive years to her post-reproductive years. And there's a few stages in that life stage. And it can go for like up to 10 or more years. So when we talk about perimenopause, that's the, the term we use, which again is relatively new, to describe the, the lead up to the big event, which I'll touch on in a minute when your period finally stops. And it is generally the most symptomatic phase of the menopause cycle menopause and I didn't even know this right when I was you know deeply in it menopause occurs 12 months and one day without a period so technically menopause is one day mm. and then you're post-menopausal mm. for you know the rest the rest of your lives and so this idea that I'll come back to just to kind of get it um, on the table early is, you know, so many women, obviously, I think just to, sorry to go back to your question about age, many women go through this transition or start this transition, you know, in their um, 40s in perimenopause. Technically, the average age of menopause is 51. But what I want to, um, I guess, raise as a key message here and my learning is that is that menopause and this whole transition is really not about age. It's it's a hormonal change that impacts all women differently. Having said that, there are some very common themes around how that affects women. So I don't love to talk about you know diagnosis, but I do love to help because because it's not an illness or a disability. But it is important that you know, we start to tune in a little bit more and empower ourselves with some knowledge so we can understand what's going on. And, you know, like you mentioned early on, and I talk about this sort of messy intersection of work and life and menopause. I mean, midlife is already a fairly stressful time for, for most women. You know, they've got a lot going on at work. They might be, you know, uh, managing people at home and at work, and they might have other care and responsibilities. They might be building homes, selling homes, going through a divorce, you know, parenting teenagers, um, maybe, you know, becoming empty nesters, who knows, right? So there's so much going on. And then you've got this sort of confluence of, you know, symptoms playing in the mix and as well as stress, right? So, so there is a lot going on at this stage of a, of a woman's life for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that's really interesting because like you, until probably a couple of years ago, I didn't realise that menopause was actually just the, the one day point between perimenopause and postmenopause. And, um, and, yeah, it is interesting that a lot of the symptoms and the bigger symptoms are in the perimenopausal phase. How about yeah. menopause? Like, does the, does the um, symptoms continue generally? I know everybody is different. Um, but on a general basis, would you say that the, the difficult symptoms that might impact somebody's work um, or their capacity in lots of areas um, in their life is, occurs post-menopause? Like, for how long would you say? So typically, so there's two quick things there. So let me address the first thing. 
I'm postmenopausal, right? And I have been for, for four years. You know, menopause is a, a, a tunnel, not a cave, but does it mean I'm out of the woods because I'm not having my period anymore? Well, well no, because there's still symptoms that are apparent for me, right? And I can see the connection between stress in my life and some things that, you know, can really, like, as I say, stress loves menopause um, symptoms. They thrive on stress. So just because you're postmenopausal doesn't mean you're not, uh, it's just different, right? doesn't mean you're not still navigating some of the impacts. But, but typically perimenopause is going to be that uh, more symptomatic phase. And a lot of the women that I interact with are sort of thinking, Gee, what, what's actually going on here? I'm not sure what's going on with me, but I'm feeling like a loss of confidence. That's one of the, one of the things that comes up often. Um, yes, so there's the physical symptoms, you know, and around 70 plus percent of women are going to experience hot flushes. Mm. Sleep disturbance is really common, mm. um, over 60 percent. Now, you just see the cascade of things in our life. You know, when I used to be awake, you know, for hours every night mm. Mm. and facing into the next day, right? I'm running a um, you know, a leadership meeting, um, I've got four kids, oh, maybe I'm going to try and uh, get to the gym. Wow, who knows about that? But, you know, the sleep, anxiety, I'd never experienced anxiety before mm. until that stage. So sleep disturbance is a really big one. Closely associated that with is night sweats because that often wakes women up as well. And then you come into those psychological symptoms uh, that do impact over half of women now you think about how they play out at work so we're talking about you know mood mood swings um, anxiety memory loss those kinds of things and they're, they're often a lot of the common ones but they don't always come in the sequence you might expect so whilst hot flushes can typically occur earlier in the <laughs> in the list of symptoms you know for me they didn't and actually if it wasn't for hot flushes it would have taken me longer to, to finally get an understanding of what was going on. You know, I had a lot of hair loss, chronic sinus infections, um, dizziness that was really concerning. I fainted a few times and in an H&M store in the middle of New York, would you believe? Um, skin stuff and, and lots more. So this discussion to help women sort of connect the dots and say, okay, it is a big busy time of life. It is stressful. But there's probably some things maybe going on with my health that I could be tolerating or ignoring right now that maybe I could maybe I could do something about without changing everything but you know just by prioritizing my health and well-being um, as a really fantastic way to protect your, your health and your career at this stage of midlife you know like our cleaner came yesterday and I was like saying to my husband you know when the kids were younger having that help at home and it still is but you know, having that help with, with being able to outsource some stuff or get some help at home is just the best thing you can do for your career. Mm. In, in midlife, I firmly believe that getting some support to navigate menopause in a very fragmented system where it can be very overwhelming is the best thing you can do for your midlife career I really and your relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so... Um, I was frantically taking notes as you were speaking then because there were so many things that came to mind that I really want to address and um, and I want to address some of the idea of, you know, the confidence issue and the, um, you know, women and their general inability to ask for support and things that they can do to help them um, ride through this phase with a lot more ease and a lot more grace. But before I do that, I want to just yeah. touch on... Um, on the fact of just where we are at the moment with workplaces and the idea of like we're sitting in a transition period and yes women can do all of these wonderful things to assist themselves like everybody can you know improve their lifestyle medicine to have less stress and to sleep better and to you know to feel more confident and all of these things like we all yeah. have personal responsibility but what happens in those situations where we haven't quite got to that phase and yes a woman might acknowledge that um all right now's the time i better better start working on these lifestyle related 
related health health stuff so mm. that I can um, get through this. Yeah. But what about before, like in that transition as that's happening, that's not going to happen overnight and they've still got a job and like you were put in that situation of I really can't do this and I need to leave and you decided to leave. But we don't want that women doing that. But let's say we have a manager and they say, well, Melissa, I understand that you're going through some changes right now, but the truth is, is these symptoms that you've got of poor concentration, of brain fog, of memory loss, of, of, you know, poor memory, of tiredness because you're not sleeping, of all of these different things, which actually new mums go through too, um, yeah. a lot of those, um, they're just not, not really, that's all great and I have empathy for you, but you still can't meet the KPIs of the job tasks. And so, you know, I don't want to discriminate. Um, I support that this is happening for you, but you just can't fulfil the role of the job properly. And I need this business to achieve blah, blah, blah by this time. And you're not just able to do that. Um, I'm going to have to need to think about replacing you. Yeah, so, I mean, there's lots of things you raised there, which is that, what can, you know, one of the things I took from what you said is kind of what can early, women do earlier? How can they prepare for this stage of life, which is, you know, why people like you and I spend probably a lot of time trying to help women and leaders earlier in career manage burnout because the physiology of burnout coming into midlife and menopause is very, very challenging and they end up being quite similar. Then we've got the women who are in it right now and overwhelmed by this idea of yes okay I know stress management's really important for me um, but I also you know want to continue in my job because you know at least one in ten women at least one in ten are leaving due to the symptoms of menopause and there's some really staggering data coming out of other parts of the world like the UK where over a million women have left the workforce due to the symptoms of menopause right so we've got 90% of, of menopausal women saying that the symptoms are negatively impacting their work now, right? So you, you picked up on that. So that can be, um, you know, in terms of productivity, um, you know, confidence, focus, um, it, just exhaustion, uh, yeah, all those, all those sorts of things. So, so what do we do about it? And, you know, that example you raised there is one where clearly which clearly demonstrates why menopause-related age, sex, gender-related discrimination is on the rise, mm -hmm. yeah? So I just read an article yesterday from the UK about two more cases. They've seen like three times the amount of menopause-related discrimination cases going through tribunals. I feel like it's happening here. It's just slower. We're often slower, aren't we, with things in Australia like it's, you know? So I think that's coming. So hence back to this idea that this is an opportunity for workplaces. And maybe I could just give an example to, to bring, you know, to life what I would call a more menopause-friendly uh, environment or manager in, the, in this case. Right. So I conducted a, a research study uh, with my team into menopause and we spoke to 20 women in depth at various stages of their menopause transition and some of them were in very senior roles. And this particular woman was in a, very, in a global multinational company in a very senior executive role. And her manager pulled her up after a meeting and said, hey, you, you just like haven't been contributing. Um, I was looking, you know, I'm, I'm leaning on you, I'm expecting you, relying on you to bring like some thoughts or a decision to this meeting and nah, what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of heading into a bit of a, maybe not, maybe not as strong as performance, but certainly, you know, some solid feedback. And to her credit, this woman did the, did the brave thing, right? Now, there was obviously a level of psychological safety there, which as a reminder is that, you know, that um, confidence that it's okay to be vulnerable, vulnerable around here. She said, I think that my memory is being impacted at the moment by perimenopause. She said, I'm going to be honest with you. I can't remember what was discussed at the last two meetings. And so I'm sitting back and I'm not confident to put my opinions on the table mm. because I can't remember what was discussed. Mm. And that manager right there, you know, had that, that sort of which way am I going to go here and just said, I'm really pleased you brought that up. 
I would have had no idea mm. that that was the case. And I wonder for whom else this is the case and what we can do about that. Mm. So that's led to like a, a sort of a task team being put in place and a, a, a network started with women and some ed education in the workplace to help managers. Because let's be honest, managers are the ones, right? They're the ones every day who impact, you know, people and performance and engagement. So they've gone down that path to become more aware in the workplace because given how much time we spend at work, you know, we can chip away at this with, you know, overwhelmed doctors who are, you know, packed to the rafters and women feeling like they need to either like absorb a bunch of menopause books or, you know, like one woman said in my research, you know, take out a part-time job to figure out how to manage my health. I had two others tell me they quit their jobs because of this as well. So we can try and do all of that or we can say, hey, what is this opportunity here for workplaces to retain their women, to understand this better? And FYI, those managers, they've got sisters, wives, friends, you know, right? This is a, a life thing. This is, this is all of our business. So those workplaces who see this as an opportunity for all of their business to be more inclusive, to be more productive, uh, will reap a range of rewards, but but that's the opportunity. And as an XHR person, what I'm seeing is we're still focusing on the basics around D and I in our workplaces. We'll get to that, or we'll figure it out on our own because HR people love trying to do that. Yeah, and so we you know miss that opportunity. Less than five percent of Australian workplaces are providing any support around menopause, and there's some awesome examples of companies that are. And I just was in a session uh, last week with ESOP who are just rolling out a global menopause policy. They're training up their menopause champions. Um, there's Future Super. So there's a range of companies, Victorian Women's Trust, you know, they don't all have to provide leave and expensive benefits. It really can be enough to start the conversation, to build some evident factual information so that uh, we're reducing stigma and uh, we're more aware of how we can do some environmental things just to support women better. Mm. Because when it's full of shame, women are compelled to push on. Yeah. And, and there we are on the path to burnout. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's so much in what you said. And, you know, just even when you gave that, that example of the when it was managed well by the manager, um, you know, and you mentioned about her not being confident to say what was in that meeting because she can't remember what she said. The truth is that if you talk about it, there's just sometimes some really simple solutions like recording meetings. Right. Um, you know, it made me think about the fact that um, the conversation around neurodiversity has increased so much and how different people, um, I suppose, learn information in different ways and have different skill sets and how we, um, we you know, some of the top entrepreneurs would have ADHD and if yeah. we just eliminated them because they weren't able to focus on stuff that wasn't important to them or that they didn't enjoy, we'd actually miss out on that, that when they're, the fact that when they are, um, when, when it is an interest area, that they're hyper focused. Right. And so it's about looking at, well, what is the situation and being able to openly discuss what the needs are, openly discuss what the symptoms are, and then together put together some creative solutions that sometimes are super simple. Well, it's kind of bringing us back to the whole business case around diversity, isn't it? If yeah. we truly believe it. Now, you know, we believe it, but it's sometimes challenging to enact it. So if we truly do, then... It, you know, it makes business sense that, you know, we, we sort of become more aware and like that's a great example that you just gave, you know, that we, that we do think about um, customising our support and benefits because we believe that we're going, we're, and, and the evidence shows, you know, we're going to get stronger kind of cultural and commercial outcomes Yes. A, as a result. Is it always easy? No, but, you know, when I was, in organisations where there was one female director out of 35 and we're all taught, they're all, oh, yeah, yeah, with diversity. But it's sort of like, well, hang on, maybe we need just to start with a bit of a target here because in the absence of anything, yeah, then we weren't getting any momentum. So whether you believe in quotas or whether you think everyone needs a menopause policy or not, like it's not a one-size-fits-all, but let's just acknowledge that those actions, mm. that intention to act, that gets the ball rolling and from there often 
you know, employees will be passionate and engaged and it starts to get a life of its own. Mm, absolutely. And it, the fact is, is right now we're at an intersection where policies, workplace policies are being rewritten. And if they're not within an organisation, then that organisation is really got to start thinking about thinking about it. Um, but, you know, things like the return to the office, new policies are being written, you know, some better than others. They're, everybody's sort of muddling through it at the moment. Um, there's a little bit of trial and error and, mm. um, and a little bit of experimentation. But even in that return to office conversation, by no doubt, women that were sat at home as they were going through perimenopause found it a lot easier to... Um, complete their work without feeling the lack of confidence or shame or being able to sort of stop and take breaks and then work later in the evening or whatever, manage their time to their totally. capability. And have a, have a fan at their desk. That's, exactly. Go and jump in, cold shower, take off your jumper, wear clothes that are more suitable because that's right. another thing, like the dress code might not be appropriate. Oh, absolutely. Um, and... This is from factory to office, you know. This is, yeah, all parts of the workforce. That's right. And so with the conversation about trying to ensure a return to office policy, that's going to negatively impact women in this particular phase. And I think it needs to be thought about. And I don't know what the complete solution is. And I don't think you can just say, well, if you're going through menopause, you don't have to. But <laughs> but I think that... No, because it brings up the, the concern around what a starting point was for an organisation and the risks of FaceTime bias and things like that. So further, you know, it's why um, there's evidence as well that some women don't, you know, want uh, policies in place because of the fear of negative perception and discrimination. That's right. Nice. So these are complex issues. And I think hearing from the people impacted is always such a powerful thing. And I, you know, I do like to say that whilst it's great to have those environmental um, things in place, like a fan, you know, at the end of the day, an informed manager is it matters more. Yeah. So for me, there's something around making education accessible and it not being you know, um, too sort of heavy, but just really helping workplaces and managers understand this a bit more. Absolutely. And so, yeah, definitely. I love that this conversation has really then included around diversity and inclusive and supportive workplaces, because that is where it comes down to. And when you talk about burnout, and you mentioned it earlier, and mentioned it in the context of if women don't address some of their lifestyle health um, symptoms or health health um, activities so that they don't or have lesser symptoms, they're going to reach a burnout. But I think the burnout doesn't come just from not looking after ourselves personally. I think burnout often comes from the culture of an organisation. So if we don't change the company culture to be more inclusive, to be more open to Absolutely. a way that women can exercise their inner power without fear and without shame and without um, feeling like they're going to lose their job, if we don't change that in the culture of an organisation and you hold on to saying what your truth is and don't speak truth to power, then that is going to take a lot and rip our energy apart. That is going to cause us to feel exhausted. Anyone well, it is. It is. That's what's happening. On. Yeah. Hold on. That's exactly. You get exhausted. It takes so much energy to shut your mouth, <laughs> you know, when you really want to say it. And, you know, pretend. It takes so much energy to pretend and be a pleaser. And But, that, but the opportunity, like you said, when you just talked about the, the best case scenario, those women are going to be your most loyal, yep. engaged there for the long term, right? And you've got all these, you've got these skills and knowledge that they've built up over all these years. So that is a massive opportunity. And that's why I think the opportunity is to be supportive and compliant, not just compliant, because people mm. see, they're sceptical about that. They're like, hmm, yeah. Mm, absolutely. You know, it just, it just really shows that menopause is something that our perimenopause and postmenopause is something that women go through from maybe let's just 
call it 45 to 55 for the sake of this conversation. Um, but it's something that actually affects everybody and the entire business. It doesn't yes. just affect the women between 45 and 55. It affects their families, which then if there's sort of um, relationship issues there because of the way that way things are happening, it has a ripple effect to the workplace. If it affects, you know, everyone else in the team, it affects the all, all, all areas of the organisation, it affects the bottom line of the business. It actually affects yeah. everyone and it's a really important topic to talk about because it happens to every pretty much every woman. Okay, so we, you know, we have said that it affects everyone, but the truth is that let that it impacts the woman who's going through it the most. <laughs> let's be honest. So let's just quickly before we wind up, if you could share maybe with us, um, Melissa, and I can give some of my own personal experience, some tips, um, some lifestyle tips that can assist women if they are going through um, different symptoms. Yeah, so I think it's really important to understand what's going on in your body and often we're pretty busy and we're disconnected from that. So, you know, one of the things I give people is a symptom tracker just to get an understanding of what's going on because their data is their best, uh, you know, that that's the power which leads into accessing good support. So if uh, you're not feeling heard or validated or supported with solutions for you by your medical partners, then find another one. Mm -hmm. Don't tolerate, don't tolerate uh, that. And, you know, I've had a lot of experience there and we, we know that women are turning to their girlfriends because they're not getting the support they need from their medical partners. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't encourage women to just push on on their own because sometimes we end up, you know, tolerating things that we don't need to. Uh, you know, which is why I'm really passionate about helping women connect the dots and, you know, I've got a women's physiotherapist, specialist and a GP on the team and we have a program specifically to help busy women do that and, and reduce their symptoms faster, get the support they need. But lifestyle um, is a good one. So I guess when we think about um, options that are available, there's sort of medical stuff, which brings up, you know, a conversation for another day, but HRT, menopause, hormone therapy, which can be really helpful for a lot of women. And we need to do a lot of work to reduce a lot of the negativity that came out of a study, you know, nearly 20 years ago that has um, really uh, led us to have more fear around this and what we need to. Then there are other medical alternatives to HRT for women who can't or don't want to take that. Then we get into um, some of the more kind of lifestyle areas. So lifestyle, you know, how we live our lives, right? So I'll just pick up on two of those perhaps. Um, women find it really terrifying to slow down and get get still uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, mindfulness are proven to support women at this stage don't be one of those people who say i'm no good at meditating or i hate meditating like i often just recommend that women um you know sit and do five minutes on their own in the morning uh, with a cup of tea or whatever that is so, so something to start the day exercise is a really powerful lever to pull. And I know when you're tired and you're exhausted and the to-do list is endless, it can be really challenging to get to that. Yet it, it improves most menopause and symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. That physical exercise then, you know, really interconnects with our emotional health and our mental health. Mm -hmm. So a little bit often, is a lot and you know actually meeting the needs of your changing body can be one of the most powerful things you do and I had a client just say to me this week you know I'm going to um you know ask slash you know FYI was my advice uh my manager that I you know I want to start attending a specific Pilates class one afternoon a week you know in in work time because you know that's what I need to do so it brings us back to this conversation of how can we make it easier for employees to look after themselves? And I think we've made some good progress there. But, you know, for women, this raises the question of boundaries. But that's another whole topic. But let me just say exercise, not just cardio, also doing some strength work. And it doesn't, you don't have to go to the gym and lift, throw around heavy weights. You don't have to be intimidated. There's so many resources available. 
a little bit often equals a lot. And it really is one of the best things you can do for your confidence, your mojo and your symptom reduction. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'll just um, extend on that a little bit, if that's okay. Mm. Um, so I want to pick up what you said about exercise and add one thing there, which is really important um, on a physiological basis is just the fact that, or of actual muscular basis is, and bones, is that an anatomy, anatomical basis, let's call it that. <laughs> Um, is that, you know, with the, with the decreasing levels of estrogen, our bones or women, you know, our bone density decreases. So not only is exercise good for symptomatic relief of, um, of feeling better, it's also just really important for our bone density. So I yeah. think that's really, really important. Like you highlighted, exercise is, is just so important as women transition through this age. And and bone density is one thing that, you know, often we don't know about and heart health. You know, one woman dies per minute of cardiovascular disease, right? I, I did a post this week on LinkedIn, you know, they are talking about I was going to get a DEXA bone scan because we lose 20% of our bone density in the five to seven years post menopause. Wow. Yeah, and, and we, we know that with age, we progressively lose muscle mass each year. Mm -hmm. So there's so many great reasons to exercise. Yeah, it's just picking one area to focus on and starting there. Absolutely. So that's great that you've brought that up. I love that you've brought up meditation because, um, and I think that there's a stigma around that word as well. And although it's becoming a lot more of a buzzword, um, people still have a a vision in their brain when they think of meditation and meditation to me I want to give an option of something you can do which combines exercise or movement and that is a walking meditation so just even go and walk around your block and ignite every sense in your body so what do you smell what do you hear what do you what do you feel what do you you know all the different things and just be present with actually every single thing around you and that is a meditation in of itself so it doesn't have to be sitting still and going when is this going to end <laughs> you know there are different types of ways of just being present and um and reconnecting with yourself and having those moments to do it and so um so i just wanted to offer that up as a as a possibility as well and the other thing I loved what you said was support and to get support. And this is something that, like you said, with boundaries is a whole nother conversation. Support is also one of those conversations. And women tend to really struggle with, um, with asking for support. They're often caregivers and they're really good at giving support, but they're not so good at receiving it. And it's, it's an issue not just for the women, but it's something that's important that if you're a male and you're listening to this conversation, um, to encourage the women in your life to ask for support, to encourage for you to provide the support and encourage them to receive it. So I think it's a, a thing that everybody can help with women getting support. Um, and everyone and everyone benefits too, don't they? You know absolutely. what I mean? Like women often end up either waiting till a crisis or they will um, receive support when it's in the best interests of their kids, their team, their, their relationship, whatever, yeah? yeah? So we often change for others. So, yeah, I do challenge people at this stage. You know, awareness is great. This is, you know, the people I work with are ready to take some action. They're not sure what or where, uh, but they want to do, they want to empower themselves to feel a little bit better. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, so good. Um, I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> and um, we have, obviously, you know, this is a huge topic and I might run some more episodes on some specific parts of it um, in the future. But I hope this episode has given everybody some more insights on this taboo topic. And my hope and no doubt Melissa's is that workplaces start to consider how they can begin to create more open communication and more psychological safety at work so that women can meet their wellbeing needs without feeling that fear and without feeling the shame. So if anybody's, if anyone who's listening today, if they would like more information, Melissa, on some of your resources or services, um, how do they find you and how do they find those? Yeah, so I've got lots of resources on um, on my website, but you know what? I'm just going to 
call out one specifically because this came from something that I struggled with, which was hot flushes. And, you know, when you are sort of navigating work and life and hot flushes, and if you had anxiety or not, it can worsen and heart palpitations and all of that. So, you know, I put together what worked for me and has supported others. Um, it's a hot flush relief formula is what I call it. And it's, it's not hard to get started with and it does help you reduce your hot flushes. So, yeah, I'm going to go with the women today uh, and, and offer that out there. And they can grab that at www.freemenoguide.com. Fantastic. And you've also got a collective, a Menno Collective. So yeah, my business is called Menno Collective. Yeah. So there's two things we do there. We partner with workplaces to do a lot of what we've been talking, you know, provide education and support to increase awareness, uh, to maximise their, you know, commercial and cultural outcomes. And I also have a, an eight-week program called the Menopause Work and Life Transformation Project, which is specifically to help female leaders reduce their menopause symptoms. Yeah, brilliant. Such great work, Melissa. And, you know, it's such an area that's really needed. So kudos for you for having the courage to step up into this space and to create programs that create such impact, not just for the women that take them, but for everybody around them. Oh, well, thanks for having me on and, you know, having this dialogue today. It's been great. And thanks for your passion. Pleasure. Absolutely. So for those listening, thank you for your time and interest in today's conversation. We would love to know what your biggest takeaway is or any insights from today's, today's conversation and episode. So leave a comment and let us know. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your network and consider subscribing to the Wealthy Living Conversations podcast and the Wealthy Living YouTube channel. If you want to find out more about my services, you can go to my website at wealthyliving.com.au. So that's W-E-L-L-T-H-Y living.com.au. Or you can find me on any of my social media channels. So until next time, remember, connection is medicine. <laughs>